Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bilal, for nice introduction. Actually, I'm enjoying, as a cardiologist, to be inside the Department of the Anesthesiology. I'm learning the anesthesiology. I, hopefully, I will not forget the cardiology. Uh, so we'll just go with this. OK. So you have the first slide? Yeah. Yes? OK. So my lecture will be about type two aortic regurgitation for lapse of tricuspid aortic valve in a normal aortic route. The case number one is a 66 year old man with diagnosis of severe MR and AR referred to our center for mitral and aortic valve repair. So this is the first uh, view. You can see the patient has a flail anterior mitral leaflet. And uh, when I put the color here, you see the severe MR and at the same time you see the severe AR as well. So this patient has a double valve disease. This AR is very eccentric and is hitting the mitral valve. Again, in this long axis view, you can see the severe eccentric posteriorly directed jet of AR that is hitting the mitral valve. So in this view, without color, you can see the prolapse of the right coronary cusp. And uh, I will talk about the criteria to diagnose the prolapse. And in this view, again, you can see the prolapse of the right coronary cusp down here, and you can see the eccentric posteriorly directed MR, AI. So the direction of the AI jet will help you to diagnose the prolapse, which, is, which leaflet is. Here, for example, we see posteriorly directed AR, which shows that the prolapse is mainly in right coronary cusp. Also, you might have, if you have a two leaflet prolapse, you might have even central AR or multiple jets of AR. This is a short axis view of this uh, patient. You see the aortic valve is tri-leaflet, right coronary cusp is at the bottom, and the non coronary cusp is beside the intellectual septum, and the other one is the uh, left coronary cusp. And as you see here, you see the right coronary cusp will is developing uh, like a double shadow appearance. And yeah, here you see the double shadow and that's a hallmark of the uh, prolapse of the aortic valve. Uh, we described it many, many years back, like 25 years back ago, we knew it from here, but we didn't publish it and somebody else published it again. So when you see the valve, you see the valve is redundant and has an extra tissue and uh, again, is, is it like a mitral valve when we have a prolapse, we have extra tissue here, we have extra tissue as well. In this view, you don't see the AI. I just put this view just to show our people that sometimes when your probe is a little bit high, you might not see the AI at all in short axis. So it doesn't mean that there's no AI. If you go the probe down like a, maybe a half a centimeter, you will see the AI better. So some measurement when we have a aortic valve and aortic root problem, uh, we do aortic annulus measurement. We measure the sinus of Valsalva, STJ, and tubular aorta. And if you want to go based on the recommendation of the guidelines and including the recent guideline, aortic annulus always should be measured at the mid systole. Aortic valve should be open like this. And the problem is sometimes you have a sigmoid septum. You might not be able to measure the especially in transthoracic, but in TE, you can see it very well. So aortic annulus in this patient was 2.4, so it's normal. 2.2 to 2.8 is in normal range. Sinus of Valsalva, we measured in diastole. So sinus of Valsalva in this patient is uh, 3.8. Again, is in normal range. We take up to 3.9 or even four centimeter as a normal in a, in a good size person. So this is a normal sinus of Valsalva. And sinotubular junction, again, you measure it in diastole. There's one important trick here that is in the guideline, but you, we don't obey it very well in the OR. Where we should measure? Leading edge to leading edge or inner edge to inner edge. Usually inner edge to inner edge is easy for us in the OR when we do quickly. But if you want to go guideline, should be leading edge to leading edge. 
it means the anterior aortic wall or sinus is included in the measurement. So this leading to leading in, is applied for all aortic measurement. That's a way that we used to measure in transthoracic, and we used to measure in T in the echo lab, and that's the recommended one. Because you wanna compare this measurement later with post-op of the patient, so leading to leading, but if you do it inner to inner, difference probably will be only two millimeters. It's not a big difference. So in this patient, all the root measurement, they are in normal limit, but this is severe prolapse of the right coronary cast. Again, this slide uh, was shown a couple of times in today by two previous speakers. And this was described by Dr. El Khouri, and I visited him many times in Brussels. So he was here in 95 when I was fellow uh, for six months. Anyway, this is his classification for um, uh, a cause of the AR and me mechanism of the AR and how we should repair it. So it's a repair oriented classification. It's a base of, for many of our lecture today. So type one is a 1A, 1B, 1C that was covered by Annette and uh, Azad and 1D. And uh, my part will be type two or CASP prolapse. This is very similar to recommendation uh, about or to classification about the mitral valve by Carpentier because he was the fellow of the Carpentier himself. So he took it from Carpentier classification of the mitral valve and he applied the same way to the aortic valve. And this is a different technique of the repair that we are going to talk about this a little bit later. So our patient fit in this one, type two, that is the cast prolapse, but normal aortic root. So aortic root is normal, except if the patient has a longest standing AI, gradually annulus and sinus of osover might dilate a little bit, but initial disease is not in the root. Initial disease is a prolapse of the valve. And we are going to talk about that. What is the cause of the prolapse? Is similar to prolapse of the mitral valve? Probably not. So how we make a diagnosis of the aortic valve, aortic leaflet prolapse is not as easy as mitral valve. Uh, so for many years ago for mitral valve, we developed uh, the, the main diagram that it still is using in many guidelines. Uh, for mitral valve, but for aortic valve, we worked a little in that time, and now we are working as well. So to, to create some uh, a robust uh, uh, criteria to diagnose the aortic valve prolapse, the one that we knew from the past is double line appearance. So anytime it's a double line appearance of the CASP, that CASP has a prolapse. And in this patient, in our patient, you see the right one has a double line appearance. The non has a little bit as well, and even left has a little bit, but the main pathology is in the right cast. So by uh, our experience and many published data, right cast is the most common one that will prolapse. And after right cast is the non cast and left cast rarely will prolapse, rarely. And we don't know the pathology. When I asked, I asked uh, Dr. David a couple of days ago, he said, I don't know why the right has more prolapse and the two other casts are not prolapsing. Because if we say, because the flow in the LV to the aorta is more from the right side is not correct. The flow from the LV to the aorta is more from the area of the non coronary cast. But for some reason, the right coronary cast uh, will prolapse more than other one. When we open the valve, you can see the valve is redundant. You see there's lots of extra tissue. And again, during the closing, you can see the double line. So double line right coronary cusp, double line none, and a little bit left as well. So it's a three leaflet prolapse that is not common uh, and is very difficult to repair. Uh, so what we learned from surgeons. Actually, I myself, as a person that I'm in the OR now for almost 35 years, I learned almost everything about the echo of the valves from the OR, not from the echo lab, because that's the best place to learn. You make a diagnosis and you, the surgeon will open and will tell you is right or not. So what we learned about the diagnosis of the aortic valve or aortic leaflet prolapse from the surgeons. This is Dr. Schaefer from Hamburg. 
and he is the main person that developed lots of things about the aortic uh, root uh, dimension and measurement, and especially the cardiologist from uh, Paris, Montessori Hospital, and that is my friend, Dr. Alan Berrubi. He developed this diagram, and this diagram now is in the recent guideline. Anyway, uh, for measurement of the prolapse, Dr. Schaefer uh, uh, suggested that we can measure the effective height of the leaflet, effective height. And he developed this caliper. So this caliper is a way that he put the, this part of the caliper to the leaflet and measure from here the tip of the leaflet to the base of the leaflet. If we draw a line here, this will be like our virtual aortic annulus. So from virtual aortic annulus to the tip of the leaflet, that's the effective height. This effective height, as uh, uh, Azad was saying, should be more than nine millimeter in normal people. Anytime this effective height, that's easy for us to measure in the echo lab as well, in the, during the TE, came below the nine, that leaflet has a prolapse. Maybe it's not severe, but has a prolapse. But when the, this tip came below this annulus, that we call it negative effective height. That is severe prolapse, like the case that I showed you. So all the root measurement, all the root measurement, they are in diastole except annulus that should be in systole. So annulus we measure in systole, the rest is in diastole, and these are the number. The coaptation height or coaptation length normally should be above four millimeter. That's the coaptation height or length. But effective height from annulus to the tip should be above uh, nine millimeter or eight to 10 millimeter. There is another important thing, again, we learned from the surgeon is the, the geometric leaflet height. So the geometric leaflet height is actual height of the entire leaflet that normally is about 16 to uh, 22 millimeter. Geometric effective height, geometric height of the leaflet is for example, in this diagram is from here to here. This one is very easy by surgeon to measure by a ruler in the OR. For us by echo is not always easy because this is a curved measurement. Some echo machine, they don't have a curved measurement. They have a straight measurement. So, but uh, like a Epic machine Philips has the curve measurement. So if you measure from the tip to the base of the leaflet, that is geometric height. If you ask me, what's the role of this? It is very important because if the patient leaflet decreases the geometric height, that leaflet by definition is retracted. So it's a retraction. At the retraction is the most important criteria against the valve to be referable. Because if you, when you don't have enough tissue in the leaflet, less than 16 millimeter in tri-leaflet valve and less than 19 millimeter or 20 millimeter in bicuspid valve, when you don't have enough tissue, you cannot repair that valve. There's no enough material. So geometric height of the leaflet is very important. If I will give you an example, when will decrease is the rheumatic disease. So in rheumatic disease, your leaflet is retracted, is short, is shrunk, and you cannot use it for repair. So again, I use that surgical criteria here. So this is easy one, because if I stop here and measure the effective height, you see effective height become negative because the tip of the right corner cusp is below this line. This is our virtual aortic annulus. So this is a negative. So this is a severe prolapse. But if I go to this cusp, that's a non coronary cusp, the tip, is about two, three millimeters. So this one has a prolapse as well. So in this patient, the right coronary cusp has severe prolapse is below the line and the non coronary cusp has a prolapse is two to three millimeter above the line. If you ask me what about left coronary cusp, first of all, I will answer you, thanks to God, the left coronary cusp does not prolapse too much. But if you want to measure it, it's difficult. By 2D TE is difficult because here, this cusp, can be none, can be left, but we cannot have both of them at the same time. But we can do by 3D NPR, and we can, uh, we can see the, each leaflet one by one and measure this height. So that one needs a little post-processing. Maybe in the OR is not easy to do it always.
But as I said, these two are collapsing more and we can easy, easily measure it by this height uh, in the OR. Direction of the AR, as I said, is helping us as well. If the direction is towards the posterior, it means the prolapse is more in anterior, uh, more in right coronary cast. So our diagnosis was severe prolapse of the right coronary cast, moderate prolapse of the uh, non coronary cast, and maybe left coronary cast prolapse because of that uh, double shadow. And all of this finding uh, was confirmed by Dr. David in the OR. And he repaired the right coronary cast by uh, Gore-Tex reinforcement of the free margin of the leaflet. He repaired the uh, non coronary cast as well the same way. But when he was trying to repair the uh, uh, left coronary cast, he saw some fenestration there. And beside, because of the age of the patient that was like a 68, 69, uh, he said, okay, if I repair this valve, the chance of the uh, recurrence will be high. And if I put uh, just a bioplastic valve, it works very well, as he believed that any Hancock valve that you put after the age of the 60, that patient will not come back again for reoperation. It works more than 20, 30 years. So in this valve, uh, he didn't push himself. He replaced it. Also, he repaired it at the beginning. At the end, he decided to replace it, and he put the Hancock valve. The case number two, uh, is a prolapse of the bicuspid aortic valve that is a little bit more difficult. Again, with normal root. So 50 year old man, usually bicuspid, they are a little bit younger, uh, with known diagnosis of bicuspid aortic valve and severe AR was referred to our center again for aortic valve sparing operation. This is a bicuspid aortic valve. As you see, the rafe is here. So this is a fusion of the right cusp and the left cusp. This is the most common form of bicuspid aortic valve. So right cusp and the left cusp and rafe is between. And this cusp that is non-coronary cusp also is better to, call, to be called non-fused cusp. This one is a fused cusp. So fused cusp is right and the, the left and non-fused one is the other cusp. So here, when you see again, you see the double shadow of the right cusp, right part. And you see a little bit double shadow of the left as well. So we can say the conjoined cusp or uh, fused cusp has a prolapse of the right part, especially, and a little bit left part, but the other one does not have prolapse. So this is the pathology, and the mechanism is again the prolapse. And you can see the patient has a severe AR. I'm not going to talk about the grading of the MR, already Annette covered that. Uh, so this patient has severe AR and the, the reason, so mechanism of the AR. Uh, so again, based on these two terms, ideology and mechanism, the ideology is bicuspid aortic valve, mechanism is prolapse. So prolapse of the right cusp and prolapse of the non-cusp. And AI again is posteriorly directed shows that the right component of the conjoined cusp has more prolapse than the left. So AI went to the posteriorly directed. Again, some measurement, the annulus is 30. So by cuspid aortic valve, annulus never is a normal. It's a little bit high normal or uh, upper limit normal. So 30 and the uh, sinus of Valsalva is 3.9, is still in normal range and uh, uh, Tubular aorta is 4.2. This type of dilatation, we see it always in bicuspid, in all bicuspid aortic valve. So is there a leaflet prolapse? I already showed uh, by echo, but again, uh, so double line and double line, that's a sign, echo sign, I can say echo sign of the prolapse. It applies to the tri-leaflet and the bi-leaflet as well. Uh, what about surgical criteria? Again, we go back to the surgeons. Uh, I'm very uh, close to the surgeon more than the cardiologist. So this is a uh, Professor Sievers from Germany. And he classified the bicuspid aortic valve in 304 patient. And he classified as a type zero, type one, type two. This is the type zero, it means zero rafe, no rafe. So type zero, no rafe. This is only 7% of all bicuspid aortic valve. This is called true bicuspid. Two commissure, two cusp, no rafe. So this is a, 
type zero. And this is type one. Type one means one Raphael. And most of the time is between right and the left. This is surgical view. So surgeon is standing here. This is the most common one, 88% of the time. So it's a type one with one Raphael. And this is type two with two Raphael. So one Raphael is here between right and the left. And one, again, this is surgical view. Surgeon is standing here, right and the left. And another Raphael is between right and the non. And this is the only commission. So this valve with two rafe, you can call it by caspid aortic valve with two rafe, or many, as Severs called it, but many surgeons believe that this is separate entity and we should just call it unicommissural aortic valve or unicuspid aortic valve because we have only one commission. So it doesn't matter how you classify it. You can say type two Severs classification or just unicuspid unicommissural aortic valve. This is an example of uh, one of these unique commissure aortic valve. You see it's only one commissure, one commissure here and one cusp. And this is the MRI of that. So how common is this disease? We said at the beginning, this is not uh, very common in adult. Yeah, we see it in pediatric a lot, but in adult, this form that has one commissure, we see it many times, but there's another form we call it the unique commissure, uh, unique cusp with A commissure, no commissure. That one does not come to the adult. Most of the time they will develop severe AS in infancy. But the one that has one commissure will come to the adult. Also is like a two in 10,000 general population. But if you look at the aortic valve replacement patient, the patient that, that will come for aortic valve replacement, it will consist about four to 6% of all patients that they are going for aortic valve replacement. That's a unique commissural aortic valve. What's the importance of this? Most of the time, this unicommissural aortic valve is associated with uh, ascending aortic dilatation, and some of them, they come with aortic dissection. What about the repair of bicuspid aortic valve? Again, we, we owe a lot to three main uh, scholars uh, in Europe, Professor Schaefer uh, and uh, Dr. al Khouri himself, and Dr. Lansek from Paris. And this uh, three school of bicuspid aortic valve, both, all of them are in Europe, uh, because aortic valve repair is not part of the guideline in North America, uh, but it is a class one indication in Europe. If the valve is repairable in AI, we should repair it. That is uh, most of this is developed in, in Europe. Schaefer is emphasizing a lot on this angle, the commissural angle. So this commissure and this commissure, what is this angle? This angle, in ideally, when you have a pure or true bicuspid valve, this angle is 180 degrees. But if you have a very severe one, maybe even less than 120. So 180 or close to 180 is very good. That's a commissional angle. And we can do the same measurement by echo as well. Like this case, you see this commissional angle is about 180. This is one of the example of the true bicuspid aortic valve. This is the, like our patient. It is like a 160, 180. This is like our patient. This is a little bit even smaller angle. And this is very small angle. This is like a trilateral valve. So looks like that we think, oh, this is very similar to tricuspid valve. So maybe this is better for repair. But in reality, it is not. The one that is very close to tricuspid valve is most difficult by cuspid aortic valve to be repaired. So again, back to our patient, if we use that criteria, we put the annulus line and measure these two leaflet, the leaflet down is the right coronary cusp, part of the uh, fused cusp. You see, this is like a three, four millimeter. So this one has a prolapse. This one is okay. So the non-fused cusp is okay. And the right cusp has a prolapse. This is the case most of the time in bicuspid aortic valve AI. The non-fused cusp does not have a prolapse. If that one has a prolapse, it's very difficult to repair. So the angle we measured in our patient is this angle. So this is the commissure, this is the commissure. Be careful, you have to close it in a, you have to measure it in a closed position of the valve. It means in diastole, not in systole, okay? So you, you freeze the uh, image, you go slowly when the valve is closed, you go from this commissure to this commissure and measure this angle. And this angle can be measured by our, by our echo machine. Is there 
and you can measure it. So 150 to 160 is not bad. So in summary, for this case, our finding was this was a bicuspid aortic valve, severus type one, right, left fusion, and type two, El Khori classification, and severe prolapse of the uh, right cusp, and uh, a little bit left cusp as well in the fused cusp, no sign of frustration, and commissure angle 150 to 160, and annulus of 30. These two criteria are not in favor of repairability. So anytime angle is more than 160 is very good. So this is a little bit difficult. Annulus more than 30 is about more than 28 is a bad sign, and we have to reduce it. Uh, surgeon saw everything that we saw, and he repaired it, you see? So very nice repair. He made the valve like a true bicuspid with, with 180 degree. And you see, it is no AI at all. It's a little bit uh, turbulence, and, uh, but it's a good coaptation height and good effective height. Effective height is like a 1.2 and coaptation height is like a 4.5. So it's a very good repair. And if you see it, uh, Annulus, he decreased the annulus to 2.5. That's good. So we should decrease the annulus to below 2.5. So there's no AI at all and no grade. And I followed this patient. There's no AI. Uh, this was a couple of months ago. So in terms of the technique of the repair, again, I just go a couple of slides only. I don't know how is the time. Uh, AI is about 13% of all valvular heart disease by European survey. So the big number of the patient and ideology as we discussed it in by al khuri classification is type one, yeah, type two and type three, that's a rheumatic. And it, so this al khuri classification shows the technique of the repair. We might do uh, subcommissional alloplasty, we might do STJ remodeling, different technique. And I just go quickly. This is a two main way of aortic valve repair with replacement of the root. One was described by Yakub in 1993, but he discovered that first in 1987, and one by Tyrone David, so David operation and Yakub operation. And again, in the TE, we can say all of this measurement uh, pre-op. And this the diagram was shown a couple of times before, I'm not describing again. This is the way that the surgeon is measuring the height, effective height. And this is a way that the surgeon is measuring geometric height by a ruler. So post-procedure, always we check the degree of the AI, effective height, uh, uh, coaptation height. And uh, there's a lots of very good paper if uh, somebody wants to read it, especially this one, a state of the art by Cuspid aortic valve repair in 2020. And is written by three main uh, uh, surgeon in the Europe, Lansek, I visited him as well from Paris, Al Khouri, the person that did the classification, and Schaefer from Hamburg, and this all diagram uh, from them. So in summary, aortic valve repair is a class one indication, level C for the surgical treatment of aortic regurgitation based on 2017 ESC guideline. But as I said, it did not come to the guideline of American so far. Interoperative TE plays a major role to define the mechanism of the AR, provide information to guide the repair, interrogate the result, and determine the predictors of the durability. Aortic valve repair is feasible in almost all patients. They say 90 times, 90% 90 of patients with either bi or tricuspid aortic valve in the absence of the valve retraction. The only time that we cannot repair is the valve retraction. What does mean that valve retraction? The geometric height less than 20 in bicuspid and less than 16 in tricuspid. And the main cause of re retraction is the rheumatic disease or old age calcification sometimes. Currently repair is not recommended for patient with a pure type three, that's a refracted, refracted leaflet, AR mechanism, except in selected patient or uh, in a pediatric or in adult source. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Omran, for a, another world-class presentation, which basically much crowns the session. And we've had, I'd like to congratulate all three speakers on, on, a, on a wonderful session. And uh, I'll open the floor to questions.
you can either post or uh, I'll ask my question by voice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roman. That was a wonderful presentation. You mentioned the measurements uh, being leading edge to leading edge versus inner edge to inner edge. And my understanding was that historically, like, the leading edge to leading edge measurement was done because it's the most consistent measurement and you have the best definition on the image. So if you're tracking patients over time to see if they're reaching certain criteria for intervention, that's the most consistent way to make measurements. But then if you're interested in actual morphologic accuracy, for sizing a surgical prosthesis, for example, then the inner edge to inner edge is probably more accurate. Is that a correct statement? Yes, yeah. So for aortic annulus that we use it for valve size is inner to inner, as I, I was showing. But the leading to leading is recommended for sinus of Valsalva, STJ, and the AC in the aorta. And as you said, the reason is leading to leading was there for many, many years in transthoracic echo. And because we want to follow these people later again with transverse echo, leading to leading is recommended. So the only time that inner to inner is recommended is for annulus. That's the size of the valve that we give it to the surgeon. Yeah, that's correct. 